Hello, my name is Lindsay Sturton and I am Professor of Public Law at the University of Sussex. I made this video to welcome students who will be taking public law with me in the autumn semester, which is due to start in a little over a month. You may be new to undergraduate studies, taking public law one, or you may be a graduate entry LLB student or a returning student taking public law one advanced. Or you might be a graduate diploma in law student taking public law as part of that degree programme. There are some differences between these different presentations of the module and these will be explained in due course. But for now, welcome. I hope that during your study of public law, you will be informed, educated and entertained to use the famous trinity of Lord Reith, the first director general of the BBC. If you're new to the study of law, as most of you will be, you might be wondering, what is public law? I'm not too keen on definitions as a rule. I think they often end up confusing more than helping, especially when we find out that the way people use a term in practice is too varied to fit any particular definition. But maybe it is okay to start with one, just to be going on with. A public lawyer whose work has influenced me, J.D.B. Mitchell, said that inevitably public law exists in some form wherever the machinery of government operates. So we could start by saying that public law is concerned with the organisation of and limits on the exercise of government power. It is the law of politics, if you like, or the law of government, in the same way that commercial law is the law of commercial affairs. Introductory courses in public law are often divided into constitutional law and administrative law, and this one is no different, except that it doesn't draw too sharp a distinction between these branches of the subject. But, but criminal law is also considered part of public law, even though it is taught in a separate module at the University of Sussex, as it is in most universities. So too is tax law, which is not currently taught at Sussex Law School. What both of these areas have in common is that they are intimately concerned with the power of the state over individuals. The power to bring charges in the courts or to fine or imprison them if found guilty, if in the case of criminal law, or the power to demand payment of taxes in the case of tax law. For now, it is more important to say something about the nature and character of public law and about the way this module is taught. The first thing to say about public law is that inevitably, given its subject matter, there is a lot of politics involved in the subject. This is what first drew me into the subject, and I know that it is one of the things students really like about this module. But I also expect that some of you have, who have never before taken an interest in politics or public affairs might find this difficult. And for a small number of those of you who fall into that category, learning more about politics and government won't endear you to the subject. If you're one of those people, I want to say that's absolutely fine. We all have likes and dislikes, and I encourage you to form your own tastes and preferences, even if you end up counting the subject I love amongst your dislikes. But you have chosen to study a topic that has some politics related content and so you will just have to get on with it. It goes without saying that we don't approach the subject from a party political point of view. Unless you are particularly good at guessing, you won't even know which, if any, of the political parties I support by the time you finish the module. Although you may hear some of my views on particular issues. Think of it like this. If you want to be an effective family lawyer, you would have to know something of the way families operate, the dynamics of how parents relate to their children and vice versa, the commitments that couples want to make to each other over the long term and what happens when they fall out, and so on. The difference is that most of us have some experience of families before we come to study law, whereas very few of us have prior personal experience of politics and government. In contrast with family law, public law can seem remote and abstract at first. We use a number of approaches to try and overcome that initial remoteness at Sussex. In seminars, you will undertake role plays or simulations in which you have to act out a scenario as a constitutional actor, as the Prime Minister or the Home Secretary, 
or the leader of the opposition. And in your reading lists, which are available online, you will be guided to works of politics as well as law that explain the dynamics of politics, as well as the legal rules and principles which govern its conduct. For every topic, you will be given a briefing note written by members of the module team. This is a shortish document that will tell you the essentials of what you need to get started on your study of the topic. From there, you can start your work to tackle lectures and seminars, as well as your own independent reading on each topic. Speaking of readings, I would like to recommend a couple of short books from Oxford University Press's Very Short Introduction series, which I strongly recommend you read before the new university year starts. If you look at how this book series describes itself, it says, Very Short Introductions are for anyone wanting a stimulating and accessible way into a new subject. The first one in this series that I recommend is by Martin Lochlin and is called The British Constitution, A Very Short Introduction. Martin Lochlin is a very well known writer on constitutional law. He describes his book as a narrative history and it's, it is just that. It takes the reader through the leading ideas and events that informed the Constitution from Anglo-Saxon times all the way up to the significant constitutional changes made by the turn of the Millennium Labour government. It will introduce you to the major events that have shaped the British Constitution over a thousand years, as well as some of the key thinkers, people like Blackstone, Albert Dicey and Walter Badgett, whose ideas have shaped thinking about the Constitution. We will learn about these events and people in more detail in the course of things, but reading the very short introduction to the British Constitution will get you off to a great start. It, it's quite a pessimistic book in many ways. It starts, it tells a story of decline. It starts by outlining the pride that the British used to have in their matchless constitution and over a hundred or so pages tells a story of loss in confidence in the constitution. I should say that I share Lachlan's concern with the modern state of the constitution but I wonder if the pride in the matchless constitution that he describes was ever as widespread as he portrays. In the Middle Ages, people harked back to the ancient liberties that supposedly existed before the Norman Conquest. Dicey's famous Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution, first published in 1885, described the Constitution that was already transforming into something radically different as a result of the extension of the franchise and the growth of the administrative state two developments that he certainly didn't love. So all of this is to say that Martin Lochlin in charting a story of decline is in really good and distinguished constitutional company. The other book in the same series that I recommend is by Tony Wright and it is British Politics, a very short introduction. There's a new edition just out this year, which I read during my holiday and I, I really enjoyed it. Tony Wright is an interesting character. He was a lecturer in politics before serving as a Labour MP for nearly 20 years until 2010. And as an MP, he became chairman of the Public Administration Select Committee, whose work is very important to those who are interested in public law and we will learn a little bit about the right reforms of Parliament which the Select Committee recommended and partly implemented in our study of public law. So he is someone who has both academic expertise and practical experience of politics. I like the book especially because it has an institutional perspective on politics which goes well with the legal study of the Constitution. It starts and ends with the Constitution and it is bang up to date which is helpful. The last few years have been unusual ones in British politics, with Brexit in particular being an issue which challenges many of our conventional assumptions about politics and the Constitution. What I also liked about 
Tony Wright's book is that although he sees Brexit as the catalyst for a political crisis, um, he relates these things to wider issues. The rise of populist political parties, which is a European-wide phenomenon, dissatisfaction with economic policies of austerity, the growth of nationalist politics in Scotland and Wales, and, this, and he talks a lot about the role of public opinion as a constraint on political decision making. It is an important theme in the history of public law and one which we will come back to during the module. So I recommend that you read these two books before the beginning of term. I would start with Tony Wright's book on British politics and this will be particularly helpful to you if you're one of these people who have never before taken much of an interest in public affairs in this country. Perhaps if you're an overseas student coming to study in the United Kingdom for the first time. So I'm really looking forward to teaching public law this year. I'm looking forward to the challenges of teaching online. This welcome video is the first of many short videos that I will be working on between now and the start of term to support my teaching. Many of these will give my own distinct take on public law issues. I have developed these in a number of articles that I have been working on with T.T. Arvind and Martin Lodge amongst others. And I have been working on an edited book with my colleagues at other universities, T.T. Arvind, Richard Kirkham and Dahi McShehe. It is called Executive Decision Making and the Courts and it will be published by Bloomsbury Hart next year. Quite a few of the ideas I will be presenting to you in Public Law 1 have their origins in the book. I will of course make the relevant parts of it available through our online reading lists. One theme that I have been thinking about is decolonizing the curriculum. This is a movement that has become increasingly influential in recent years. There is a student organized university group, Decolonize Sussex, and you can find information about them on Facebook and Instagram. I'm not involved with that group in any way, but seeing the Black Lives Matters protests challenged me, as it did a lot of my colleagues, to ask, is my reading list too white? So I thought about how I could introduce some black perspectives into the teaching of public law. It so happens that I have an interest in Jamaica as a country. My first job as an academic some 20 years ago was at the University of the West Indies. And I thought that looking at Jamaican experience, both as a British Crown colony and then as an independent country with a constitution very much in the British mould, sometimes called the Westminster model, could sharpen our understanding of our own public law as well as giving an insight into the colonial history of our constitution. We will also look from time to time at the constitutions of other former colonies and dominions, including Canada, South Africa and Ireland. For me, this is not about political correctness or jumping on the latest bandwagon. It is about taking some first small steps in the direction I probably should have started on years ago in order to improve my teaching for everyone. I will give just one example. One of the first issues we will look at in public law is that the distinctive nature of the UK's unwritten, or perhaps more accurately, its uncodified constitution. We will look at whether it would be feasible or indeed desirable to condense a thousand years of tradition and experience as a writ into a written document. Jamaica's independence constitution of 1962 was modelled after the United Kingdom's, with the crucial exception that it was codified. So an examination of Jamaica's experience can teach us a lot about the difference between written and unwritten constitutions and the challenges of codifying what in the context of the UK are non-legally binding constitutional conventions. All of this is to demonstrate that this is a really interesting time to be teaching and studying public law. Our constitution is in a period of change and I can't always promise easy answers to questions about public law. What I will try to do is help you to ask better questions.
and I look forward to meeting all of you in about a month from now.